3,000 years ago, King David founded the Jewish state in our eternal capital, Jerusalem. In the thousands of years that followed, the Jewish people fought off danger and persecution. Tyrants came to power, seeking our destruction, but we survived, persevered, and held on to our land and our religion. We never gave up. We never will give up. I want to show you something. Here in my hand, I'm holding a 2,000-year-old coin from the year 66, one of many discovered right outside the ancient walls of uh, Jerusalem, the old city. And I'll read what it says on it. It says, Chirut Zion in Hebrew. Chirut Zion is the freedom of Zion. Interesting that if I entered a time machine 2,000 years backward, I'd actually, after a couple of days, be able to speak the same language, just adapt the, the accent, but they spoke back then the very same Hebrew that we speak today at the very same land where we live today, and th those are my direct ancestors. So it took a while, but eventually the Jewish people got the job done. Today we're back at home in Israel. In 1948, we established the State of Israel. In 1967, we liberated the United Jerusalem. I say this for those who continue to claim that the Jewish people do not have a historical, national, or religious link to our land, and there are such people. I show the coin so people who continue to call and work towards our destruction understand that they'll never succeed. We're here to stay. The Jewish nation survives largely because we don't give up on our past. In Israel, we might be able to travel on the same paths that Abraham, Jacob, and King David walked, but at the same time, all of us are paving new roads in science and technology. This manifests itself in no place better than Jerusalem, where you can visit the Temple Mount, the Western Wall, and the Dome of the Rock, and then on the very same day, head over to nearby Intel factory, where the chips in your Samsung tablets are developed. You can walk the Via Dolorosa, tour the Church of Holy Sepulchre, and then go visit the R&D center of NDS, a company that was founded by Israeli entrepreneurs and sold to Cisco last year for $5 billion. We preserve our great history, but at the same time, we're building our future. Ladies and gentlemen, from Tunisia to Egypt, Jordan to Syria, and Libya to Lebanon, a storm has hit the seas that surround us. It's a storm that's just begun, but it could last for 10, 20, maybe 50 years. It's the storm of radical Islam with the ultimate goal of creating a regional hegemony. But there's one place which has withstood the storm. This place is Israel. Israel is a lighthouse in a storm. Like a lighthouse, Israel has strong foundations, a flourishing democracy, a strong economy that's growing, and the most powerful military in the region. And our roots to this land date back 3,800 years. Israel will withstand any storm, no matter how fierce it might be. But a lighthouse is not only about having strong foundations, it also projects light, light to the world. Israel is the only true democracy in the Middle East. We're the only country where all religions can practice openly and free of persecution. In Israel, unlike some of our neighbors, women can drive, elections are free, and people can protest against the government without fear of imprisonment or death. And man, they protest a lot. It's the one place where Jews, together with 1.7 million Israeli Arabs, enjoy full and equal rights. But despite these successes in our state of 65 years, there are still some people in the region who have yet to come to terms with our very existence. Instead of embracing our democracy, they fire rockets our way. 
Instead of accepting our hand of peace, they plot to undermine our way of life. Instead of teaching their children love, they spread, spread hatred to the next generation. This is a new era. This is the era of chaos. On our northern border, Hezbollah has built up an arsenal of over 100,000 rockets and missiles, perhaps the most concentrated such uh, group in the world. On our southern border, we're facing a growing threat in the Sinai of terrorists from Gaza, working together with global jihad elements who originate in places like Saudi Arabia, Iraq, and Yemen. And in Syria to the northeast, the Al-Nusra Front is setting up shop, and part of the violence there is already spilling over the border into Israel. But there's also some good news. This is the first time in Israeli history that we're not facing an immediate conventional threat. The Syrian military has eroded, and peace with Egypt has survived its most challenging days in history. We do not control the region, and the chaos has nothing to do with what we do. Therefore, our policy as a government has been quite simple. We do not interfere with chaos. We do not try and influence chaos and the region. In Syria, for example, we expect ongoing instability in the near future. We're also not sure what the outcome of the ongoing conflict will be. Will Assad emerge victorious, or will he be toppled by the rebels? We don't even know what's the right outcome, if you will. It's so chaotic. But as a nation that values life and abides by the Talmudic dictum that he who saves one life is as if he have saved, has saved an entire universe, we couldn't simply stand by and watch tens of thousands of people get slaughtered. For that reason, without fanfare or publicity, we quietly constructed a field hospital in a small enclave along the border where IDF medical teams have treated hundreds of wounded Syrians. A few weeks ago, an eight-year-old Syrian girl was brought to the border from her home in the Dara region in southern Syria. Her leg had been shattered in a mortar attack. We didn't ask if it was a mortar fired by Assad's forces or the rebels, but we took her in and brought her to a hospital in Tzfat where she underwent surgery. A few days ago, she took her first steps. We did this because it's our responsibility as a lighthouse in this era of chaos. With this as the Middle East backdrop, I'd like to share with you my own story. I was born in Israel to American immigrants who had come from California. I grew up in Haifa, many call the San Francisco of Israel, a city on the shores of the Mediterranean, with the same TV shows and fast food like the rest of you. At 18, I was drafted into the army and served in Sayeret Matkal, one of IDF's elite commando units. It's the unit that did in Tebi back in uh, 1976. After the army, I began working in high tech and in 1999, I, I co-founded Sayota with three very gifted friends. What Sayota does is anti-fraud software for banks. So when you log on to chase.com or citibank.com, we actually make sure that it's you and not someone who stole your username and password pretending to be you. And today, 70% of North American online banking transactions go through my company's software as we speak. We look at anomalies and things that don't make sense. Why is Tamara in Latvia right now transferring $30,000 to North Korea, for example? <laughs> so we're really protecting uh, the West and uh, in, in uh, Western Europe, in uh, Japan, against uh, the bad guys. So in 2005, we sold the company for the $145 million, and that's the point where I'm supposed to be in the Caribbean with one of those little cocktails in an umbrella in a pool. But Hezbollah had other plans, and on uh, July 12th, 2006, the very day I finished in my company, uh, they started the second Lebanese war, Lebanon war, by kidnapping uh, two soldiers. And instead of vacation, I found myself deep inside Lebanon leading commandos on covert operations. 
My job and my expertise in, in the military was to hunt down and destroy rocket launchers which were being used by Hezbollah in attacks against Israel. In fact, they were shooting it at Haifa, where my parents lived, so I, I really did feel that I'm protecting my own family. And here's what a typical Hezbollah house looks like. You have a living room, a dining room, a kitchen, kids' room, and a missile room, where there's a missile launcher, a movable ceiling, they shoot the missile, and then they close up the ceiling. That's how they operate. That's the enemy we're up against. The Lebanese war made me realize something. My generation, which came to age in the 80s, you know, the 40-year-olds, we took Israel for granted. I grew up never thinking that we face an existential threat, and likewise, you know, all of us who grew up in the 80s. I was born in 1972, a year before Yom Kippur War. I didn't experience it. And it was, you know, just obvious that there's no existential threat. And then inside of Lebanon, there were a few new things that happened to me. First of all, it was the first time I was fighting as a dad. I had my one-year-old Yoni, who was already born, and my second daughter was in the tummy of my uh, wife. My wife was pregnant. Tell you one thing, it's a whole different ball game when you have young kids. I now understand why people go to the army at the age of 18 and not later on. But the second thing that, that struck me, I, I was there and I asked, what do they want? What does Hezbollah want from Israel? Do they have any territorial claim? No. We left Lebanon to the very last centimeter in 2000. And then I realized what now everyone realizes, they just don't want Israel to be. But that was not obvious to us uh, until 2006. So with that in mind, I decided to leave the private sector and enter the public sector. I spent a couple of years with uh, Netanyahu as his chief of staff in 2006 to 2008. Recently, about a year and a half ago, I uh, ran to lead the Jewish Home uh, Party and won the primaries and, and changed the mission from being a lobby party for the religious people, those with the yarmulkes, to being a party with a mission and a goal to restore Israel's Jewish identity, pride, and purpose within our people. One of the first things I did was open up the party so secular Israelis can enter, and interestingly, the number two individual who was elected in these primaries was a secular woman, which is unexpected. So the religious folks basically said, we want to open up the party. First time in a hundred years of this party that predated Israel. And I believe that's part of my mission, to, to serve as a bridge between the secular and ultra-Orthodox. In Israel, Something we need to learn from you in Israel, everyone's in a compartment. So do you have a knitted yarmulke, which means you're Zionist and religious, or a black yarmulke, which means you're Haredi ultra-religious, but is it big? And what if it's black and knitted? That's confusing. Um, and, and I view this mission uh, of creating this bridge. I'll give you one example. So the Kotel, the Western Wall, has been an area of conflict for 25 years because... It was controlled, it is controlled by the Orthodox. And what happens to egalitarian, to other streams, reforms, conservatives, they couldn't come and pray the way they want to pray. 25 years of, of fighting. Two and a half months ago, I instructed the CEO of my ministry, quietly, go build a third plaza. You have a men's plaza, a women's plaza. Go third, build a third one, 50 meters to the right, and it's up. And he asked me, you sure you don't want to bring it to the government? I said, no, do not bring it to the government. We'll just argue it to death. Just go build the thing. And it's beautiful. And in fact, this week there was a huge prayer of about 400 American Jews. And I'm proud that today we have a third plaza, which I call the Israel Plaza, which is open for everyone.